Welcome back to another episode of the podcast from the depths of darkness to the light of success. I am your host, Chris Swick. And on this podcast, we talk about mental health, addictions, eating disorders, ADHD, and really anything anyone's afraid to talk about, we talk about on the show today. Let's make people afraid to not talk about these things in the world. Let's break the stigmas around them. There really shouldn't be a stigma around mental health, in my opinion. It shouldn't be there at all if we would all just band together as one and work together and learn from one another in this world. But with no further ado, I'd love to introduce you to my next guest. I got Amy Corey from the Nashville area of the United States. She's a musician, artist, She's the Jill of all trades. You want to take it away and let them know a little bit about you, Amy? That's such a sweet introduction. I'm so honored and happy to be here. And it's amazing to collaborate with other people interested in mental health and mental health advocates. And I definitely have been one my entire life and careers and going through self-harm and eating disorders and depression and just everything someone could go through in mental health and trauma. It definitely has been along on my journey as well. And I took that into my career when I was 18 and be, and became a singer and a songwriter. And I was signed to Kent Wells, who is Dolly Parton's producer and has done all of her work. And I kind of did that for a long time and got into business and continually just spoke out about mental health and was put in front of so much press. So that really became a passion that led me into public speaking and touring schools. And then I really got into that and I actually stepped back from music to focus directly on that. And at the same time, I was doing a lot of work with Vietnam where I was born and became a, an ambassador to um, a peace foundation there that is run by the former president, former ambassador to the EU and to Belgium. So I, I put my fingers in a lot of things and I always am juggling a lot, but it all has to do with helping people and trying my best to shine light onto their lives for them to ignite within their own. And it's just been an amazing journey and I'm happy to be here to talk about it. Yeah, you know, thank you again for coming on the show. And before we get started, please head over to the podcast page on YouTube and hit that subscribe button, turn on the notifications. And if you're on Apple or Spotify, you can leave a review now. So please do that. It helps the show grow organically. But Amy, you were talking, you were adopted. Was it by a family from the United States, from Vietnam? Yeah, I was adopted from a Caucasian family in Ohio. <laughs> which is not where I grew up, but yeah, they adopted me. They adopted my older sister from China and then they adopted me from Vietnam. And yeah, I was six months old. So, so you were able to be with your biological sister then too, eh? No, she's, oh. no, no, sorry. She was adopted from China oh, okay, okay, a few years okay. earlier and then I was okay. adopted from Vietnam. Yeah. Okay. My misunderstanding. So how was it since you've basically been here since you were an infant? So you've really only known the United States ever since you were a young baby then? I can definitely sense, and especially going back to Vietnam and, and becoming close with so many Vietnamese people, I can definitely sense what, you know, is running through my blood as a Vietnamese person and the mindset and the work ethic that they have. But obviously I grew up in, in America and is very American as well. And that's all I've ever known. And both of my parents were did so well by celebrating my culture growing up. We always celebrated Tet, which is Vietnamese New Year, and was always something that I should be very proud of, was being Vietnamese first, but growing up in America. And so I feel very lucky and privileged to respect and accept both sides. Well, that's amazing that your adoptive parents were able to help celebrate your culture from Vietnam as well, which is nice and didn't just wash it under the rug sort of thing. And helped you learn your origin and the country origin that you did come from and stuff like that. It was, it's one of their best parenting, <laughs> in my opinion, because <laughs> they were able to do that with both me and my sister very successfully. And so they celebrated the like Chinese New Year's and mm -hmm. the, the, the different um, things that go on there as well. Yeah, we celebrated both because they both revolves around the lunar moon cycle. And so both of them are at the same time. She got a little bit, she got the Chinese food. I got the Vietnamese food. She did some of the Chinese traditions and I did some of the Vietnamese traditions. And it was just something that they got us in so well to just love who we are, like love every aspect. And I think that really pushed me in my adult life to really just hone in on, you know, when it comes to racism and discrimination, to know that 
the things that they are racist and discriminative about are the things that I love about myself. And it was a very good setup by, I think, my parents who really got me into that. I'm so sorry if you can hear that. Oh, that's okay. It's not the end Dang. of the world. But yeah, no, that that's amazing that they were able to do that for you and your others, your sisters. I always love me in the winter, a good bowl of pho. So <laughs> <laughs> every day I could live off of my gosh, I, that's all I ate every day when I was in Vietnam for three weeks, every single day. They're huge on their soups over there. I find like I have lots of Asian friends, like from high school and school and I'd go over to their houses. And it was always a soup, even for breakfast. Mm -hmm. You know what? <laughs> My boyfriend always tells me that. I'm just like, he's like, every time I say, what do you want to eat? I'm just like, I want soup. He just doesn't <laughs> know how I can survive off the soup, but I can't. I just love it so much. <laughs> Why is it such a big thing over there? I, I've always wondered that, but you know, I've never asked the question, but I may as well ask it today. Well, I honestly think it's just in, in the end, they make whatever they can make. And soup has always been so easy because it literally is just, bones, vegetables, and the broths are so easy to make because you can make it out of anything. Yeah. And it's just most of the time, honestly, just water. Like you just, you just make the- Add some broth. flavors to it. Yeah. And so it's just cheap. It's just easy. And the ingredients are just so accessible there. And it's delicious. And it's become this, like a huge staple of Vietnam. And it's, I'm, I'm so, you know, thrilled like worldly well-known and it's something that vietnam can hold on to and be proud of as, for sure as, i love going really down the road to, like an hour to go either to like chinatown in toronto where it's much bigger there and just getting some real authentic you know asian food and stuff like that whether it's pho or chinese food or thai you know what i mean <laughs> yeah oh my gosh yeah I, I it's so bad when people ask me what my favorite foods are and i'm like I always say Asian. I'm like, I'm not biased. Like, I swear. It's just great food. Like <laughs> It is. It may not be the healthiest sometimes, but it's good comfort food. <laughs> oh, yeah, I agree. Trust me. <laughs> so what are your hopes and concerns for your community and or the country with the rise of mental health issues and concerns going on today? I think there's definitely a lot of darkness when it comes to it. And I think if there's a lot of light still. I always say if you can't see darkness, you know, surrounding you, just know that it's always in you. And I think that's the biggest thing is I think when it comes to the rise of mental health, it's obviously still very misunderstood. Like it has the wrong perception on it. People with mental health trauma have a negative um, perspective or people think they have, people have a negative perspective on people with trauma. And everything is still getting educated and worked out. And I think, unfortunately, the ones who fall victim in a sense to that are the people who go through it, who are still unsure because it's still so new to them in a sense of what they're going through, how they're feeling and understanding themselves first, and then having to listen to what society is telling them they should feel or telling them this and that and being in that mental state, not really being able to see the difference and see what's you and what's them. And I'm not putting words in anyone's mouth, but I remember feeling that as a child when I was bullied and everything is you aren't sure exactly what you're supposed to feel. And so going within is the only way to really understand what your true voice and what is just background noise. And so I think that's a lot of confusing times, but I think because of that, so many people have been able to come as a community together and be opening to listening to a lot of mental health advocates, mental health groups, and people who can do motivational speaking, can do this, or even just in music, I always saw it and always went towards people who wrote their true feelings. So there's so many people and so many things out there to help you. And I think that's such a light is there's becoming more and more people to do that now. I love that you say that though, too. Don't always listen to what's, you know, put out there on social media. Because it's so easy to, our brain is a wild thing up there and it can be very dangerous to get inside your own head, I find too. Yeah. And I get inside my head a, lo a lot more than I would like to, but it's just working through those problems. You're telling myself that this isn't real, you know, this is going to pass, those types of things. You know what I mean? You got to talk that positive self-talk to yourself too sometimes. Oh, absolutely. And it always starts with yourself. And I think that's the biggest thing. And I think by accepting yourself, accepting what you're going through, it puts everything onto you. And I think that's one of the biggest things is, especially in America, a lot of 
beings uh, aren't ready to take responsibility for their actions, for their words. And so it's still that sense of a blame game towards other people. This person did this to me and this is why I'm feeling this and that. And there's a lot of truth in that. But in the end, everything does always come back to you because that's all you can control in your life is your reaction, your emotion, how you are seeing this perspective and understanding, taking an extra 10 seconds to understand what this is teaching me instead of why is this happening to me? 100%. I, I love that you say that. We're all responsible for our own actions and reactions. And that's all you can control at the end of the day. But also having that awareness. I'm learning this still to this day, two years clean and sober, about having humility. You know what I mean? Owning my actions. If, if I did something wrong and my fiance will call me out on my bullshit and I do like it and not have to be told, hey, you should, you shouldn't have done that. Or you should have, you should be apologizing for that. You know what I mean? Just be just doing it and apologizing when you are wrong or owning your actions is huge though. Absolutely. And then it goes a long ways though, too. It's not that, like you said earlier there in this conversation about the, he said, she said yes. And the blame game and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, only person you have to blame is yourself for whatever's happening to you. You know what I mean? Like you have the control to change your outs, you know, the, your outer circle. Yeah, absolutely. And congratulations on your sobriety, by the way, I just want to say that's amazing. But also to your point that I, I always believe that a really healthy mindset really can like a big benefit is that is having someone who tells you the things that you tell other people. You always need yourself and another person who can understand the way to communicate with you. Because I feel like when we give, give and express and share our thoughts and like our inspiration and our light, we're always needing that put back into ourselves to continue delivering. And so when I remember when I found my boyfriend, he was able to communicate and tell me the things that I tell other people. And that was a huge benefit in my health and my mindset and my mentality and my emotions to know that I myself, even though I'm with so many people who believe they're alone and I'm there to show them they're not alone, I'm not alone in it either. And so it's a really beautiful thing to just be able to say, yes, I was wrong or yes, I caused harm. And in the end, I always say, and this is, goes back to a Buddhist practice, is that someone who causes harm to someone else, that someone else is just victim number two. They're always anyone who projects, hey, this and that, it's always going to hurt themselves first. So true. And if you project onto others, there's, it, you're projecting your own insecurities at the end of the day. And I, again, I'll bring it back to myself, working on those things too, just from so many years of abusing drugs and alcohol. And then I, ha I always had this victim mentality, blaming everyone else for why I did things. But at the end of the day, I'm the one that did it to myself. You know what I mean? Like I had control, I had the option, but I just felt like burying my pain, burying it and burying it and not talking to anyone about it. And then it usually just explodes like a big atomic bomb. Mm -hmm. And it's never usually good at the end. Yeah, no, I remember that for sure. Because it's not even the fact that like your glass overflows. It's like your glass is already overflowing. There's just an instant hit of something that just breaks the glass. And that's the hope that you hope no one really has to experience. Because like you said, the downfall in that is very consequential. But look at you, look at me, like we're, here we are now going through it and being able to talk about it and be sober. It's, there's always light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> oh, 100%. There is always light at the end of the tunnel and learning to live in that present moment and not worrying about what, yes, yesterday happened, but you can't worry about it because you can't change whatever happened yesterday. We can't worry about the future because we don't know what the hell is going to happen. But just trying to live in that present moment today too is a beautiful thing as well. Going out into nature, taking that walk. We had a chat the other day, me and my fiance too, about just slowing down. She's like, why do you walk so fast? I was like, I don't know. It's also my ADHD as well. I, I have ADHD, so I'm all, I got 50,000 things on the go, I, but I got to slow it down and reel it in. That's the beauty of our relationship. She reels me back in very quickly. Oh, <laughs> oh that's so sweet. I love that. Yeah, I agree. I, I, always, I always say we suffer from the memories of the past and the imagination of the future. And so all we can do is be present so we can create actually what we want to create for them. But you I have like to be focused one. within that. <laughs> I like that one. Thank you. So you touched upon bullying. So were you bullied as a young kid in school or what, where did that all start? And what sort of 
transpired from that? What were they bullying you for? So I grew up in a tiny town in Oregon, and I was in middle school when cyberbullying and Facebook and MySpace were just so big because it was just, it was the beginning of cyberbullying because of how big those social platforms were. And during that time, in being at peace with it, I can say from my personal experience that during that time of middle school, we're still trying to figure out what's right and what's wrong and how to treat people, how to not treat people that you hope will eventually become awareness in your adult life and not do it again. So there is just so many things. There is hatred. There is fat shaming, even though I've always been a five foot tiny Asian girl, <laughs> very tiny. And it's things that I knew weren't true about me, but at the time I didn't know what else to believe because my parents were going through a really rough divorce. The house wasn't as safe as you would want it to be when you're having to deal with stuff at school and wanting some type of safe place. And so it was just hate on hate on hate and phone calls and Facebook pages and all of the type of cyberbullying that unfortunately we see today, just back in 2009 when it was just them. It was just people's opinions, people's rumors and this and that. And I think it just because I was, you know, so young, I was 10, 11, 12, it, it was, it got to me in a sense of, okay, this is who I am because I wasn't sure exactly who I was. And so I listened, like I said before, to all the background noise instead of listening to myself. And it wasn't the thing that pushed me over the edge to start the self-harm and the eating disorder, but it definitely became a huge part because it made me not want to be myself anymore. It made me not want to even be in this world anymore because everything was just so negative. And so it was a beginning for me to understand what hatred really was and taking it out on myself because I then believed that I hated myself as well. And that's the negative side of it is being told something so much you start believing it, even though it's not true. Yeah, and but, it's the sad thing about the bullies out there and stuff like that. And sure, I think everyone, maybe not everyone, but most people have probably either been the bully or been bullied in their life as sure. well. I, I know I was a bully growing up. I and then wondered why I was getting crapped on in return and stuff like that. But it was my own doing what I was doing to other kids or whatever on the school ground and stuff like that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think everyone has experienced, witnessed, or has sensed negativity and hatred. And especially now these days, hatred is, you know, plastered everywhere. But what, you know, has made me really understand what bullying is, what hatred is. It's obviously as an adult and still seeing it, but we're not in school anymore. We're not developing our minds and our growth, our mental state. We're adults just honestly hating on hating. And it makes me a lot more understandable on why kids do it because they see this influence and they think it's right. And it's passed down to them because I always believe that someone who projects the way people do yelling is something that they've hurt themselves and they think is okay to do as well. And that goes back to the victim number two saying is in the end, you're just the second victim. But I truly believe in the way that I've always lived my life and does the best I can, especially in the music industry and the public eye that I've been in is that to always show kindness because the people who do hate are the ones who need, who need to see it the most. And like I said, it goes back to, I can't control what they are saying, what they're doing. All I can control is myself. And I personally, my, I was just telling my boyfriend this the other day at dinner. I was like, I never want to be the person that someone goes home and says, made them ha feel this way, made them sad, made them depressed, made them have a bad day. That's one of my biggest self fears just who I am as a person in my career. I, I just always want to be kind no matter the way I'm treated is just showing something that they might not be familiar with. And I hold myself to that very highly. I like that you say that though, too, because that always sits on me, especially in the industry I work in and what I do too. And I know I've gone home and made someone feel like a piece of shit just from my pat the way I was in the past and stuff like that. But going forward, acting, having those random acts of kindness or like that it's saying is kill them with kindness. You yeah. don't need to be an, an asshole or anything like that. If you just kill them with kindness to even the guy that's pissing you off or whatever, 
and just leave it be or just ignore it if you have nothing nice to say at the end of the day. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, you know, it's, I think it's understanding that it's something I think that we all, in a sense, have to learn is that we're the main characters in our story, but we're not the main character in everyone's story. So their problems are not with us. And that's the separation. That's the understanding is that we are being projected on. But it honestly, probably most of the time has nothing to actually do with us. And so it shouldn't affect us the way that it, it does, because it has really in the end nothing to do with us, especially when it's that racism, stranger hatred vibe. And I like that you say that, though, too, like some people may be angry or projecting it towards you. But really, they're not angry at you. It's maybe you don't know what has gone on in their life or how their day's gone either. Yeah. You know, and some and it, you, you don't need to take it personally. And I used to do that a lot and working through those things, too. But if someone's angry, sometimes they're not angry at you. It's just maybe they have something going on at home or you know, someone just passed away or whatever it is. But they're not really angry at you. And you got to ask yourself that, too. Like, what what has gone on in their day to make them feel this way sort of thing? And they're just you're the one that person that's in their way while you're talking to them sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. And everyone's fighting a war and sometimes they just carry that on to other people. In the end, I can't do anything about it. So all I can do is just try to show them the peace, try to show them the kindness and the way they take that in, whether they accept it or reject it. In the end, I've done the best I can. And I know I can't change every single person I meet and I'm not trying to change everything. I'm just trying to show them that kindness and light still exist in a time that may seem so dark i love it i love it just spread kindness everyone spread kindness <laughs> like confetti <laughs> <laughs> so what would you say brought you down the musical path in the beginning because you've been doing music for a long time now was it the things that were going on in your life with the self-harm and the eating disorders and stuff like that was that sort of an outlet for you the music at the time and then you Absolutely. just became so it's funny so i was living the dream while i was living the nightmare that's how i would always explain it i got to start vocal lessons with a guy who was taught by seth riggs who made michael jackson and cb wonder and taught them this type of vocal technique um, called speech level singing. And I started doing that when I was eight years old. And, and, and for I, the people that don't know what is speech level singing is a technique of singing that that focuses on the physical aspects of where the voice can come from. So I learned how to sing out of my stomach, which gives me a more kind of powerhouse voice. Why Michael Jackson, why Stevie Wonder have been able to continuously sing their entire life is because they're not singing from their throat, they're singing from their stomach. And that's the type of technique that was taught to me to be able to hit every single note, be able to hit everything because it's not coming from me pushing out air. It's coming from me taking up my breath from my stomach and my diaphragm and pushing it out as my voice. So it's a very interesting it sounds technique. like a very hard and difficult technique probably to, like, I used to have hold. hold. I used to have to <laughs> hold the doorknob and lean back to enhance my diaphragm. It was rough. <laughs> <laughs> but I was, I did that from when I was eight all the way to 18. So I did it for an entire decade. And so I was living that dream while I was going through the self-harm and the bullying and the depression and everything. So I was balancing it out. And that was the only hope I had in my life because I was writing, I was singing. I was planning for the future at a time where I didn't believe I had one. And so it was the only thing that kept me going in a sense of this could still happen. And my hero was myself in 10 years because no one was really going through it at the time and or at least vocalizing and publicizing it. People obviously were going through it, but it was something that kept me going. And so when my when I was about to go out of my junior year of high school, I knew this is what I was going to do. I went, I came to Nashville with my mom, who later, six months later, passed away from cancer. And so it was that way of, this is what I said I was going to do. And you can always talk about something, but it takes action to actually do it. And so I moved to Nashville when I was 18, and I just worked my butt off. I had a day job, nine to five, and then went to writer's rounds every night from five to like 2 a.m., and did that for a whole year. And then I hired a lawyer who, um, who is still with me today. And we started looking at artist management, artist development, and our path stumbled across Kent Wells, who 
heard of me from a few other people and it blossomed through there. But what's funny is the way I got my artist development deal wasn't for my music. It was for the mental health aspect. It was for my story and it was for the work ethic that he saw in me. And he related it to Dolly a lot, who obviously has been become one of his biggest success stories. And that's how I signed with him. And so before I ever released music, I was signed with PR and I got endorsed. I got endorsements. I got publicity. I got newspapers, all just talking about mental health, all just talking about what I've been through, what I've been able to overcome. And that hope of me just showing people that you're not your mental health trauma and you can not only become anything, but you can create anything as well. And that really pushed me through my music because I was writing songs about my life, writing songs about the darkest times. And I got in with all the songwriters. I got in with people who weren't even in the music industry, were from the TV industry, the food industry, the business industry. And it just kept expanding and expanding to where I decided that three minutes of a song was not even long enough for me to say what I wanted to say. And I went back um, and stepped back to be able to do public speaking. That's amazing. And that's the whole premise of my show. And I love that you say that. I believe everyone's story is valuable at the end of the day. It doesn't matter what walk of life you come from. We all have a story and we should share it, you know, what in whatever form it is, whether it's journaling, writing it down, talking to someone, doing a podcast, interviewing people, whatever it is. You know, I believe everyone's story is valuable at the end of the day, Amy. And yeah, you have an amazing story so far, for sure. Thank you. I believe that too. I, and I hope that's in me all what I'm able to accomplish and achieve is knowing that I help just one person be able to communicate with themselves and understand themselves to be able to communicate with other people and continue spreading that chain of light instead of the type of chain we see lately with to just, it's always going to be a ripple effect, no matter what you say or do. And I just hope that ripple effect is just happiness and light and hope. Oh, I love it. I love Thank it. You. What do you want your legacy to be when you're long gone? It's such a cliche thing, but I just want to, I just want to be known as the same person in a sense of, I want to be known for doing something good and being, I be that and try to be that and live up to that every single day in my personal life and in my work life. And I just want to be known for someone who tried their best to stay kind and tried their best to continue spreading kindness. And I always am a big believer and my biggest saying is the world doesn't get better. You just do. And I hope to always be ahead of the world in a sense of light and kindness and no matter what gets thrown at us to stay in balance and to stay in peace and be known that she did her best and she was able to do it it's kind of my biggest hope <laughs> nice no and then and if you just keep doing the next best right thing as they say these things are going to happen for you this legacy is going to be amazing of yours i feel it Thank you. I believe in reincarnation. And so all I want to do is live up to my highest potential to be reincarnated into a tree and be able nice. to get a break from You have like a particular tree, tree <laughs> or just any tree? Like a redwood or something. Like nice. Oh, you're going to grow really big. Big, <laughs> far away from people and just get a break from humanity and hopes that my past life is able to get me to that stage. Right down the Pacific coast somewhere, eh? Yeah, that would be fantastic. That's the goal. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so do you have any regrets from the past year? And if so, what were they? I I personally don't have regrets because everything led me here. I think there's been times where I thought that maybe I could do more in a sense. I think that's always something that I truly wish. Oh, I could have shown more kindness, shown more help, done something to show something that I didn't fully put all my effort in. That's the stuff that I think about. When it comes to regret, I just feel like every action has led me to a moment where in this time and this past year has been so happy. And it's crazy to even think about. I I was thinking about this when I started dating my my boyfriend now, just, you know, going through stuff with like my ex, if I would have fought harder or if I would have said something different or not said anything at all, like he and I might have worked out. 
but that's never something that I would ever want, especially being with my person now. Like, it's crazy to me how much I think about this stuff to know that if anything changed, I would not be where I am today. And I am the happiest I've ever been today. And when it comes to regrets, when it comes to an action standpoint, I personally am able to be at peace with everything. I think when it comes to words and when it comes to saying something, not saying something, that's where I can fall short in a sense of overthinking it. But obviously it's in my head now to where I can, when the cycle comes back around, I have that second chance on, you know, doing exactly what I wish I would have done. And so that's where I'm able to find that balance. So it's like you learn from something that you did before. All right. How can I do this better? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what can I do to change that? So we have a different outlook on it the next time sort of thing. It's like the definition of insanity, doing the <laughs> same thing over and over again is not going to get you a different result. I'll tell you that it's going to be the same result every time. Exactly. And I think I'm just, I'm just obsessed with growth ever since I've, I feel like when I grew up physically, I was able to grow up mentally because I was going through all of the trauma then. And it put me in this mindset where I'm just obsessed with growth. I always know that if I was fully grown to my potential, I would be dead because there would be no work left on this life. And I've just become so obsessed to where every time I think of something that I wish I would have done, I just sit with it. And I just sit on accepting what happened in the past and working on myself so when that cycle comes, I don't repeat it. I can heal it. I can find peace with it. And I can move on to the next thing that I'm supposed to be doing. And it's, that's the type of cycle that is fulfilling to be. Do you have any books that you could recommend to the audience that, you've, that have helped you along the way? Is there like a particular book that you enjoy and you'd go back and read again and again? I love a lot of Tet Nhat Hanh books, who's a Vietnamese Buddhist monk. He writes a lot about communication and self-development. I will say I just read a book that I lived in London in 2020 and the bookstores were the only places really open at the time. And I kept seeing this book that I never read. And I actually bought when I was traveling a lot because I like reading on the plane. And it's called The Choice. And it's a book about a um, Holocaust survivor who then shares her experience in the Holocaust, but then becomes a doctor and a psychiatrist and is, does something it's similar than what I did going through something and helping others who in a sense, go through the same emotion. Obviously hers is a lot more extreme. And it was the most inspiring book I've ever read to someone who in the Holocaust had no choice but to starve and then treating a patient with an eating disorder and have, seeing her have to understand and find empathy towards this girl who is choosing not to do something she didn't have a choice to do. And it was the most fascinating thing that really woke me up on how to communicate with someone, how to find empathy and how to understand that even though we all go through different things, the emotions are the same thing. It's just put onto a different mind. And I- What's the name of that it. book? It's called The Choice by Edith. I, I can't pronounce her last name. That's but fine. If, the yeah. choice, if we probably type in a couple keywords about the Holocaust and stuff, yeah, Aggie yeah. can probably find it. But the choice I'll have to and definitely check that out. I love the library, beautiful. so I'll probably go see if they have it. I fell in love with the library again when the pandemic happened. And I'm not a big reader. The things I read for the past six years were always contracts. So always, <laughs> it was probably nice and refreshing I, to read a book. <laughs> I was just like, oh my God, the pages actually turn. I'm not having to highlight. Like it's when the no initials here. And no initials, <laughs> no signing and no contract. I'm stuck in for five years. So it was amazing. But that book, that Han book, I love a good memoir. I love, I've always been fascinated knowing, you know, what I had to survive in other people's survival stories on how, when it came down to it, how they were able to continue going and continue able to find light. I've always been fascinated in listening to other people's stories to be able to see and understand every person who may cross my path. I love learning what makes people tick or but, why they yeah. did this. I'm a memoir person too, or a self-help book. I'm really diving into learning more about ADHD now too. And learning like ADHD from my perspective and what it's like to live with someone with ADHD for my partner and stuff, because it some days can be, she 
patience is a virtue of hers. And even lots of people have said, I don't know how you put up with him. He, you must be so patient, like friends of mine that have known me for years and stuff. It's just me, but she's very patient. She's helped me grow into who I am today. That's what it's all about though, too. I love that. Let me know if you found anything good because I, I, I had ADD as a child and I think because I'm so busy now, I'm able to really take a control of it. But my partner also has ADD. You out, you will never outgrow it. And I've done that research, like even talking to other people on the show too, but you never outgrow it, but it's all about like your healthy habits and the things yeah. you do. You, you may be able to help regulate it with, I have medication for mine, but also just to reel me back in, it's all about time management for me too. Like getting really good time management, not just wasting time. Yeah. Instead of having that two hour nap on a Sunday where I could be working on content or something like that. And then I've yeah. wasted two hours of my day when I didn't really need that nap, but I just like to, but, but just time management is huge, but yeah, no, I'll definitely let you know if I find anything else too, because it, it's really interesting. The more and more things have come out now. Yeah. Ex yeah, I love it. And I regulates a good word instead of outgrow. You, you're, you're able to find a way to live in a sense the best of it and being able to regulate that i like that but yeah well, because I, I thought i got rid of it too trust me but no after <laughs> doing some more research and talking to more people not even experts in the field but people that have done thorough research and content creators and like social media pages that i've had on my page and stuff no i didn't really outgrow it or get rid of it it was just the drugs that was burying it for all those years you know what i mean so maybe it just didn't show through in a sense when i got cleaned up and got on the right medications and stuff it's been a hell of a lot better ah oh, that's so amazing to hear i'm happy for you thank you <laughs> yeah before we go though amy who has been your biggest inspiration or your greatest inspiration Why? probably there's so many people. I, I get inspired. The one that keeps me going is my mom who passed away. She was the one who believed in me from birth until still now in the sense of she's here to help me guide through all the chaos. The inspiration for me honestly comes from the people I talk to. And it honestly comes in a sense when they always tell me how much I inspire them. I always have to remind them that it's them who inspire me because knowing what I do and knowing what I'm trying to do it hasn't it won't work unless I have someone to do it with and they're the ones who can like even make my day and send me a dm and seeing their stories and how they're getting through it that's the type of inspiration that just makes me not only feel fulfilled but it just makes me feel so like happy cry understanding and knowing like how strong these kids are and them being able to be strong enough to share that with me. It's very inspirational. And it's, I've met some amazing people and just anyone who continues like you in a sense of just being able to continue finding the light and holding on to it, growing it. Anyone who does that is an inspiration to me, truly. I can't pinpoint a main person other than my mom because there's just so many people who just continue bringing me hope and bringing me light. And that is something I really hold special. I love that. It's so true though. Like when I, I hear so many different stories on this show and people I interview and then people I've become friends with, everyone has their own inspiring quirks and stuff to them. And, and it's just amazing to see what everyone is doing and what everyone's done and what everyone is going to do. The growth in everyone is amazing. I've seen over the last couple of years when you really open your eyes up and see the whole picture. Yeah. And I think that's the biggest thing I learned in the music industry very early that people listen with their eyes. And instead of telling someone, you got to show it in a sense. And I think that's the biggest thing is actions have to lead up to words. And to see everyone doing so many amazing things and to be able to see it, you get that sense in your mind that, okay, this is possible. And I think that was the biggest thing when I got into my career is I'm so proud of every scar left on my body from my self-harm and confident and has no care in the world, who sees it, what they think of it. But to show them that someone like me with scars can be signed to an artist, can become a public speaker, can meet all of these people and be able to have such a beautiful life. But it was looked down upon so much growing up, but now there's so much beauty in it. And just to show that someone who has been through so much is being is able to create so much for her life that's good and i think that's a beautiful aspect in anyone's life is to be able to just 
separate themselves from their mental health trauma because they're not their mental health trauma. Like you are you. And that's just something that just happened. I love that. You've given us a very true and inspiring and vulnerable story today. I truly appreciate you coming on the show to share that, Amy. But before we go, can you share with everyone if they want to, maybe if you do online public speaking or whatever you do, if people want to book you or if they just want to come follow you and follow along on your journey, where can they find you? Yeah. So on my social media, it's just Amy Corey and Y-C-O-R-E-Y. And I, I actually do life coaching now and I just am rebranding my life coaching, which is called the misunderstood mindset. I'm actually rebranding to be able to open up to more people to where there'll now be a monthly and an annual membership. And that's going to come in the next month. I'm just finishing up all the trademarks and um, the website and everything. So I'm so excited to share content that people have been wanting to see. And especially since I'm not touring as much to give access to a healthy, safe community. And I'm super excited for that. And um, if you follow my accounts, that will just be there because I'm just excited to share with you. Just, you're just moving in and rebranding on that page, eh? Yeah, I'm just, nice. I, I love I'm it. so excited, yeah. Thank Don't you. need to start over, just move right in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's always the evolution. You're always evolving. Exactly, um, exactly. Yeah. Thank you again for coming on the show today. It was amazing to have you on the show to share your experience, strength, and hope, and just some good inspiration, some good chat, and some good insights and everything going on. I so appreciate it. Thank you so much for having this platform and letting me be a voice on it. You're welcome. <laughs> I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you, you too.